As we enter the 1990s, the live steam hobby claims over 15,000 active members across the North American continent. Over 120 live steam meets are held annually, with the largest of those attracting thousands of spectators. An international brotherhood of live steamers meet sponsored by the Los Angeles live steamers will typically see around 10,000 people pass through the gates. But the popularity of the hobby is reflected in more ways than just numbers. Hobbyists have interwoven a network of friendship throughout America, where information is exchanged, support given, stories swapped, and brotherhood shared. But it hasn't always been this way. How did it all get started? How far back does the live steam hobby in America go? Who were the first people responsible for its early growth? To answer these questions, New Life Productions went right to the source. In June of 1989, we traveled to the East Coast to talk with the founder of the Brotherhood of Live Steamers, Carl Purinton, then approaching his 92nd birthday. And with his son, Charlie, who has been right there by his father's side watching the hobby grow. We also talked with Adrian Bizey, longtime friend of Carl's, and one of the founders of the Pennsylvania Live Steamers, the first live steam club on the East Coast. While we were visiting Carl, we watched movies of some of the first Brotherhood meets and visitations from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. We also viewed some old photos, including a set of priceless albums called the Wandering Locomotive Books, discussed later in this program. We were overwhelmed by the marvelous treasure that we saw before us, a treasure that documents the roots of the live steam hobby, a treasure that we knew had to be preserved. So here, in the next 60 minutes, you will see film footage and photographs previously viewed by only a few, now preserved for the many, so that the tradition of live steam in America can be passed on to future generations. In order to show you as much of the film footage as possible, we will be running it throughout most of this program as you listen to Carl, Charlie, and Adrian tell the story of those early years. Wherever possible, we will identify the year, the track, and the event before each clip, but the conversation will not necessarily be specific to that particular footage. We don't think you'll mind this method of production. From what we hear, you want to see trains, trains, and more trains. So here they are for you now as you listen to the story of Live Steam America, the early years. The genesis of the Live Steam hobby can be traced back almost as far as steam motive power. Models of the early pumping engines are still surviving today, and working models of steam locomotives can be traced to well before the turn of the century. In 1892, there was described with illustrations a live steam locomotive built by a young man named Pagenhart, who uh, lived in uh, Western Maryland. And he had built a seven and a quarter inch locomotive. Get the gauge, seven and a quarter inch. Now this was 1892. And he had built this up in uh, two years and he was only 19 years of age. And this locomotive was entered into the, the World's Fair exhibition in Chicago in 1892. He won a medal, and so astounded as I was, I made a note of this, and I said, no, anytime anybody wants to know about the beginning of live steam in the United States, they better go back to 1892. Pictured here from volume one of the Model Engineer magazine in 1898 is Thomas McGarrigal of Niagara Falls, New York at the throttle of his 12 and a half inch gauge locomotive. He built it 
for use at the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition in Omaha. McGarrigal claimed that it was the smallest train ever built for the conveyance of passengers in seated cars. Although such live steam enthusiasts existed before the Brotherhood of Live Steamers began in the early 1930s, few hobbyists knew of each other's existence. Alone in his cellar, or in the shed out back, the live steamer worked long and tedious hours, bent over his model locomotive. Perhaps just a few towns away, another lone hand labored over his engine too. How delighted they would have been to meet and share information. But there were no avenues for this kind of exchange to take place. And so each continued with his labor of love, thinking he was the only person crazy enough to attempt such a painstaking project in that part of the world. Until the Brotherhood of Live Steamers was formed. But the whole idea of the Brotherhood goes right straight back to LBSC, who's the man that should get the credit for, because that was his idea of a secretary that would register names, and I simply volunteered for the job. Those initials stood for the London, Brighton, and South Coast Railroad on which he worked. And of course, the idea of the Brotherhood was that there would be a, somebody who would act as a secretary with whom different ones could register their names. And they could write into the secretary to find out if there was anybody near them doing the same thing that they could get together with. And that was the idea of the Brotherhood. For 30 years, he was the secretary, voluntary secretary of the Brotherhood of Live Steamers. He got some assistance, oh, quite a few years ago, a man named Harry Dixon, uh, Pacific Coast, but uh, it was primarily Carl's idea. He volunteered when uh, the first word went out in the British model engineer to be the secretary here in the United States. He served manfully, with great credit. That's why I always say, he's a granddaddy of the hobby in the United States. The first Brotherhood of Live Steamers meet was held at Marblehead, Massachusetts at Carl Purinton's home track in 1933. It was a historic event that began even before Carl himself had a chance to leave the house and steam up. The, the, the first meet of the Brotherhood. Tell them about it. Your old place in... Uh, yes, my one I lived in Marblehead. In Marblehead, yeah. 140 I foot I had track. 140 feet of back and forth track. Probably 40 feet of that might have been portable. It could have been taken out and stored away. And a lot of the old timers came to that. Ed Berg and Harry Sate, uh, Harry Fisher, Doug Ed Massey, Berg. Ed, Ed Berg Ed was Berg. the first one to show up, wasn't he? He was the first Early one in the morning. to show up one morning. Mom looked out the window and she says, gee, there's somebody out there already. Well, I think in some ways it was an interesting meeting because it was probably the first time a lot of the builders ever got together to exchange ideas. And <clears throat> Mom was a great hand to make fish chowder. And she used to make a great big pot, a kettle full of, of chowder. We'd go to the fish store and get a whole, lot, a whole bunch of fresh had it and then she'd fry the egg I uh, fry the onions and in those days the marble headers would tell you if you want good onions you gotta fry hell out of them to put into a chowder <laughs> and the hard crackers and that thing and and coffee and we used to serve that to them at noontime everybody had a grand time that way <laughs> 
PLS meets met annually at Marblehead until the numbers became too unwieldy for the Puritans' home track. From 1938 on, the Brotherhood of Live Steamers annual gathering met at Danvers, Massachusetts, in addition to other locations throughout the country, such as Lachine, Quebec, Toronto, and Oakland, California. Later on, when we started having the first of them at the old New England live steam track in Danvers, we used to run them two days, it's like a Friday and a Saturday, or I think it was more apt to be Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. And at those meets, they used to come from all over. We've had people there from California and Oregon and Winnipeg in Canada, or Montreal, Toronto, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and down all around. It was a pretty varied assortment of live steamers from all over the country. In the 1930s, another idea got started, that in addition to the Brotherhood, helped live steamers from across America come together. Tell them about the wandering locomotive book, because that oh, was Ed's that idea, was, wasn't it? Yeah. That was Ed Berg's idea, that you get together a loose leaf notebook. And I would write an article on a page, and I'd put in a few pictures. Then I'd send it to Adrian, and he'd do the same. And then he'd send it on to somebody else. So that in, over the years, that book oftentimes would be gone from me three years from coast to coast and perhaps back to Canada. And I have to say that over all the trips that thing made, there was never a thing taken out of it. I was always impressed. These were shipped around in a wooden box. And eventually there were five big volumes. And as I say, it's a history of what some of the real old timers uh, all across the country have done and we're up again. This is a typical entry in this first of the wandering lo locomotive books. This is uh, from Harry Fisher in New Jersey. Uh, the pictures are of his two and a half inch gauge Hudson. This would have been the, a model of the first class of Hudsons on the New York Central because of the Walshat valve gear rather than the Baker gear. He describes the construction of the locomotive and what he's proposing to do for the boiler construction. And also, he's all figuring on his next locomotive, which was a two and a half inch gauge 2884. Harry Sate was one of the first old timers with the Brotherhood of Live Steamers and a close friend of Carl's. Carl's son, Charlie Purinton, talks about the first time his father and Harry got together to talk shop. This was the result of having met Harry, or having seen two of Harry Sate's engines at the, Sportsman at the show. Sportsman Show in Boston. Uh, mother decided we should learn something other than uh, just railroads for spare time. We should go to the Sportsman Show and see some of the things that were in there. Must have been about 30 minutes. Yes. 31 is the date. Okay, yeah. Good enough. Yeah, it would be just about there, wouldn't it, from that picture? So, uh, in we went, and the, uh, we saw, you don't want to know all about the sportsman show and all the rest of it, and the trip in and all that stuff, how I got car sick and everything. So, and we saw Harry Sates' two locomotives two and a half inch gauge engines. One was a Flying Yankee, a Pacific, and the other was a Boston and Maine Berkshire, a 284. This was a great thrill to father to know that some other person in the, somewhere near where he lived was, was trying, did know how to build the thing that he was trying to build. So the name and address of Harry Sate, Old Orchard Beach, Maine, 
was copied off of the, the card on the engines on a letter mailed up to Harry. And we went up to visit him. And this, this uh, in that, in that period was, was in the Model A Ford. And Harry's engines, he steamed one of them for us. I think it was the 284 on the it portable was track on, on the garage, the garage floor. floor. Yes. If too bad somebody didn't, uh, couldn't have seen the airplanes that were in there, because in, in the garage where we were running that locomotive in 1931 or 32 were three airplanes, as I remember, stored. But anyway, we ran the engine, and it did run, and this, this was my first real live steam locomotive that I ever saw run was Harry Sates 284, about 1931 or 32, which would make me about nine or 10 years old. Back in the early days of live steam, starting a fire took almost as much ingenuity as building the engine. Charlie tells about the time he witnessed one ingenious method that without a doubt got the job done. But starting a fire in those days was quite a proposition. Uh, the, there were very few people who knew how to fire a, a small locomotive. W.G. Landon was one of them, and he had had a lot of experience by 1930. He, you will find letters to the editor and articles by W.G. Landon in magazines back in the early 1900s, 1908, 1910. Landon was a very, very clever person, and, and he built fires uh, a very practical way. But Harry's uh, father hadn't, hadn't developed a, a real good system for it yet, and Ford Motor Company had not yet invented Ford briquettes. So what Harry Sate used to do was to fill the boiler up most full with water, and then before the engine was connected to the tender, he would put a bunch of coal into the firebox and pump up the hand blowtorch. Everybody used gasoline blowtorches in those days. You used them for everything. And he'd light that off and then aim it through the fire door. And when he had maybe 15 or 20 pounds of steam, something like that, well, then the blowtorch would come out and he'd hook the tender up and you could use the engine's own blower and everything went fine and dandy. Well, one time down to Marblehead, Harry was doing this, this same procedure on the track, back and forth track, and, uh, and uh, he had the blowtorch in the fire door, and a uh, puff of wind came, uh, came by and got a back draft or something and blew out the, the flame on the, on the blowtorch. Father and Harry were no doubt at it again this, this way. <laughs> Never noticed that the blowtorch had gone out. I hadn't really either. But what, we, we became aware, aware that the roar was gone, so took a look and found that the blowtorch had gone out. So Harry said, well, that's nothing. And, and he, he used to use wooden matches all the time, and he'd put the thing in his hand and scratch it with his thumbnail. I tried it once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, did that hurt. <laughs> and light, light, he lighted the, relighted the blowtorch and stuck it in the fire door and boom! There was a big flame came out of the ash pan with a great big cloud of smoke and cinders and soot and everything came out of the smokestack. It's, it was just something else to see. There, he says, I guess it's lighted now. That's the way to clean the smoke box and ash pan. <laughs> oh, he was a lot of fun, Harry was. When he got through running an engine, the, the 284, he would bring it, we would bring it down into the cellar in cold weather. And he put it on the edge of a blanket, lay it over on its side, put the blanket over the engine, and then clump, 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 roll it across the floor three or four times, then pick it up by the ends and put it in the trunk of his car. He was a lot of fun. Well, he was one of the first old timers around here, too. Yes. But I suppose around here, the first one of all was W.G. Landon. <clears throat> because in the, Charlie said, in the 1930s, he had a very beautiful two and a half inch gauge New York Central 440. And he had a bunch of five or six cast iron cars, which probably weighed for, I guess, 70, 75 pounds a piece. And that little 
engine on his elevated track would haul those cars round and round and round like nobody's business. He made all his own patterns. He had the crudest lathe anybody could imagine. I don't think he had a drill press, as I remember. His hole, the holes were either drilled in the lathe or with an egg beater. But he turned out the most beautiful work you ever saw. Well, I think a lot of people today, <clears throat> with the articles and things that you read, seem to think that in order to build a locomotive, you've got to have practically a tool room. And that a locomotive, and what they want to build is a precision, precision built job. They don't realize that a locomotive, except for one or two parts in the valve gear, <clears throat> it's got to be a pretty crude piece of machinery. For this, if you take a Pacific engine with three pair of driving wheels, and you have your side rods. <clears throat> They don't seem to realize that if one wheel drops into a low spot on the track, that bearing is going to run hot because it's, the crank pin is at an angle to the hole. And if the hole isn't a little oversized, that thing is going to run hot until it gets warm enough so that it's perfectly free. And in the old days, you'd hear a steam locomotive come into a station, and the rods would be clankety bang, 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 bang. Well, that was just simply because they had the proper clearance, we'll say, in the bushings and the side rods, so there was a free running thing. And coming into a station with an engine like that, all you had to do to keep the rods from banging was just to not quite shut the throttle so that there was enough steam there to back up the lost motion, and then just before you stop, you shut the throttle, and you come into the station reasonably quiet. On the small engines, when Brocklin sized it up pretty well, he told me one day, he says, you know, Charlie, they don't really run well until they're almost worn out. Well, that's about right. They're so you build them, them free. Half, build them half worn out, and then they'll run well for a long time. Yeah. And you don't have to have a tool room to build a lathe, uh, to build a locomotive, unless you want to build an inch and a half big one. Then you've got to have something size. But the old timers like Harry say, they had a lathe and a drill and uh, a grinder and a few hand tools, and that's all they had. They had the desire. That desire was usually inspired by a profound love for railroading. Many old timers having worked for the railroad at one time or other in their lives. You can bet they all had their favorite stories to tell about those good old days. Well, Ed Lever was an engine man out of Providence, Rhode Island, and he used to uh, enjoy the commuter run between Providence and Boston. One of the reasons he enjoyed the commuter run, he told me one time, was that they didn't care how fast they went, how rough the trip was, as long as they got home or got to work as quickly as they could. Never any complaint about spilling the soup or spilling their coffee. This one day in the wintertime, he had left Providence on his way to Boston with a morning commuting job. And when he got to Sharon, uh, everything had been all right so far. But just as he was leaving the station, he sneezed and his teeth went out the cab window. He put the brakes into emergency and jumped out of the cab down into the snowbank and was searching in the snowbank trying to find the hole where his teeth went when the conductor came up and asked him what the heck was going on. And Ed said, I lost my teeth. So he and the conductor went rummaging through the, the snow drift and they found the teeth and Ed was back up on the engine and right into Boston as fast as he could run it. He said when, when you were dr dr running commuter jobs, a lot of the passengers were regular every day. And uh, they got to know you and they'd wave to you and leave their newspaper on the, on the gangway when they went by the engine and it almost got to be like old friends meeting. <laughs> 
He said this morning when they went by the engine, they all of them looked up and gave him sort of a grin or a laugh or a, or a wave. And he said they seemed much more friendly and they got a big, big kick out of, out of waving to me that morning. He said after, we, after I saw the conductor, I asked him if he had by any chance told, him, told the passengers about my spitting out my teeth. And he said, sure, he says, I told all the ones that I knew. So they got a big kick out of that trip. After that, Ed Lever, all, almost always had a cigar in his mouth. Uh, it was, he never smoked but, more, but about half of it, and the rest of it he kept clamped in his teeth so that he would never do this again. Uh, and in our club, after he told us this story, his nickname became Cigar Butt Lever because even when he were running the Little Maisie up at Danvers or any of the other big tracks, he always had a short cigar clenched in his teeth. Charlie Purinton has been a first-hand witness to the 15 or so model locomotives his father has built over the years, an apprenticeship that began when he was just a young boy. Probably the, the, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of my father, myself, and building locomotives is when I was a very little guy, oh, what, eight or ten years old, perhaps, when he bought the first bunch of castings from Coventry and drawings and unpacked the whole lot and think, oh, boy, then put the wheels here and some there and whatnot and keep on going that way and, until it looked like you had a whole locomotive almost ready to put together. And then uh, it dawned on the whole lot, on the, on the both of us, that that there was a lot more to building a locomotive than just putting a bu gluing a bunch of castings together like a plastic kit does nowadays. So there, there was a lot of lathe work and a lot of machine work to be done. And he had set up the lathe and the cellar and all the shafting. He had a, a belt. Everything came off of one motor. The lathe, the grinder, the drill press. I still got the same motor today. And this this whole bunch of shafting, uh, he would start it after I had gone to bed at night to do the work down in the shop. And I would hear this ka-thump, 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 ka-thump of one of the belts, the main drive belt to the big pulley, and then there'd be a clickety-click, clickety-click of the reverse belts going for the lathe. And, and all this, uh, it, it was what I heard when I was going to sleep at night. Most of us at that stage, we made our own patterns, and we took them to our own foundry. Yes. We didn't send out and buy a set of cylinder castings. We made the pattern and took them to foundry and had them cast. That applied to the far as the cylinders and the driving wheels, or the wheels, which were the main castings, and then we picked up pieces of copper tube for the boilers wherever you could get hold of it. Plumbing shop, or once in a while, some of the copper and brass people would sell you a length of three and a half inch tube, or whatever sizes you want. But we didn't go to the suppliers because there weren't any. We made our own stuff. And we did our own designing. This was, in the this was in the 30s. This was in the 30s. Buyer's market. You could buy secondhand lathes or those brand new lathes. In 1933, the South Bend lathe people were selling their. Well, I their, bought a new South Bend lathe for about $150. Yeah, that's yeah. right. As a matter of fact, you got one stripped down for $75. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Uh, now, Carl mentions the castings. You go to a foundry. Oh, uh, they didn't want to handle the little stuff, but it looked interesting. And he'd cast them up, and you'd go to get your castings, and he would weigh them, and he would sell them to us by the pound. Incredible. Yeah. Well, well yeah. many, many uh, guys, of course, were out of jobs, and they needed something to fend off the worry of the depression and so on. And uh, many turned to hobbies. And 
many of them turned to live steam because there were a lot of people then who were interested in railroads. Of course, and those were the days before diesels, when you could, well, as a matter of fact, all of us in those days before cars had to travel by train. I remember my family, we were on a farm then. We didn't have a car. Uh, and then it was a Ford Model T, and it was 1920. And, and you didn't drive very far with it. So if you went anywhere in the country, you always went to the station and you got on a steam train. Pictured here is Ella Cinders, one of the earliest seven and a quarter inch gauge engines in the hobby, built by William H. Nichols of Waltham, Massachusetts, sometime before 1932. When New Life Productions first arrived in New England, we were told by several live steamers to be sure and spend some time in the Puritan cellars. It was the best tip we received all year. Carl and Charlie have collected an impressive array of engines, photos, books, magazines, and other railroad memorabilia over the last six decades. By far the greatest treasures in this collection, however, are the locomotives some of which were originally built by friends and passed down to the Purentans, others they have built themselves. Here now are Carl and Charlie doing what all live steamers like to do best, talking shop. This engine here is the first one that I built to fit the three and a half inch gauge. And I started this after I had finished my first two and a half inch gauge jobs and a rebuilt of a 466 that a friend, a young friend who lived in Marblehead had started and never able to finish it because he had a sickness and died. But by the time I got to this red hen, I had run across not only the model engineer, but also the English Mechanic, which was another English magazine in which LVSC described some of his locomotives. Anyway, I took this job in hand. The first part that I did, I built the tender first which I found by experience of the other engines, it was a good thing to do because if you finished the engine first and then went on to the tender, you were apt to rush the job and, and make a mess of the tender. I departed a little bit from Lawrence's design in this engine in that I hung the radius rod in back of the link instead of in front of it which I found gave better control of your valve gear. I also used Duralumin side, side rods. And instead of using cast iron spoked driving wheels, these were turned from the solid. And for counterbalance, I simply drilled some holes opposite where the crank pins were. And this is the only engine amongst my shed, as Lawrence would say, that is set on springs. Everything else was equalized without springs because I figured you didn't have to ride the engine. And if it rode hard, it made no difference. This is a bell pair boiler. It has no superheater which I found in this engine, it made no difference to its steaming ability or the length of run. And I also put a rotary disc throttle on the front. I also took the delivery from the water pump, brought it through a coil of tubes in the smoke box before it was delivered to the boiler, which I thought perhaps 
would be of more advantage than superheating the engine. And when we used to run this engine at the track in Marblehead, you could have a nice thin fire in this job, maybe half a five-eighths of an inch thick, but a flat fire. Get the engine to go in, hook her up one notch off a of mid-gear, set your throttle, and then you could ride and ride and ride until you got tired of sitting. And it's, I must say that out of all the three and a half engines I have, this would be my favorite job. I also want to say that on the taper barrel here, it was rolled from a flat sheet, and then where the edges came together, there was a strip, butt strip, on the outside that was riveted and brazed, which gave you the equivalent of a good tube. And it was Lester Friend that helped me with the silver soldering of the boiler parts. He had a acetylene torch, and I all I had was a gasoline bow torch, which in this side size would have been useless. The engine also has water driven, water driven, axle driven water pumps. And the feed to the water pump is controlled by a valve in the tender. So that when you don't need water in the boiler, you're not pumping it round and round and back to the tender. I got on to that trip trick, or I should say Charlie and I did, after I used to watch him running the, his 040 at Danvers. When he'd be coming up the hill over the trestle, I often would watch him reach around the tender and pinch the water suction pipe. And without touching anything else, the engine would go twice as fast. And from that day on, we decided that the bypass valve in the tender that shut off the return water that the pump was trying to push back and shut off the water to the pump, it would be to our advantage in operating. And since that time, that's the way we have always piped up our engines. The decal or the decoration on the side of the tender was done by my friend Bob Hornsby, who also did the painting on this engine. This locomotive is a third rebuild of Ed Lever's Maisie. Ed Lever was an engine man on the New Haven Railroad and was not only interested in the full-size locomotives, but also was, in his spare time, was interested and did build small lo live steam locomotives. His first locomotive was a two and a half inch gauge Coventry Pacific. This was a very popular engine in the late 20s and early 30s. After this first two and a half inch gauge engine was squared away, Ed got interested and did start to build this three and a half inch gauge English locomotive. He made a very good choice because LBSC's Maisie is probably one of the best stock, so maybe stock locomotives for which you can buy drawings and castings. This ran at Danvers uh, at the first BLS meet on the New England Live Steamers track in 1938. Uh, Lever liked to run fast, both the full-size trains and the small ones. After a, a year or so of, of Ed's buzzing around the track at Danvers, uh, he came up the hill very fast one day and threw the switch and the locomotive tender, the flat car, and Ed took off of the track and all landed on the ground. From then on, that part of the track was known as Lever's Leap. When the engine hit the ground, the frames were, were bent out of shape, the side of the top of the smoke box was dented in, Ed had a hunk gone out of his ear, uh, 
And that was the end of the run for Ed that day. Well, Harry Sate did the first rebuild on the engine after that escapade. Uh, it was never quite as good as it was before it got bent out of shape. But it still lasted a long time and gave Ed many, many hours of pleasure. After Ed died, Mrs. Lever gave the locomotive to my father. And my father did a considerable rebuild on the engine. This originally had inside, had inside valve gear, but he rebuilt it with new cylinders and Walshart gear on the outside. The Great Northern Railway did have a class of these locomotives that did have the outside valve gear. So this is not, uh, a, this, this is authentic for one of those locomotives. Uh, after he had finished rebuilding it, we gave it a steam trial and found that there were some things that were not the way they should be. So I got to do some work on it too. A uh, new reverse lever, a uh, new ash pan, new grate bars, another lubricator, a uh, few other small things that, that were done to it. And now it's a, it's a very, very nice engine to run. I haven't run it yet this year, but I had it out for an outing last year. And it, to me, it is, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, when I'm out there, I feel that some of these people who used to be running this engine and watching it are sort of watching me, and I enjoy it very, very much. This locomotive is somewhat of a landmark locomotive in, in New England. It was the first locomotive to have this type of cylinder to camouflage a slide valve. This was Harry Sate's idea to, to build this steam chest casting this way in order to do so. Uh, Harry's friend made all the patterns for this locomotive, the cylinders and the driving wheels. And Laverne Langworthy had the castings made and gave them to Harry for the privilege of being able to sell or uh, market this type of, of cylinder. Uh, this engine was on the track in 1937, and it's the first three and a half inch gauge locomotive that ever I saw run or ran myself. And I spent many, many happy hours as a youngster running this locomotive on the back and forth track at Pleasant Street in Marblehead where the first BLS meet was held. This is a very powerful locomotive, and it was a very successful locomotive. In so much so that Lester Friend, when he started the Yankee shop in, in Danvers, and he had also decided to build one himself, uh, marketed a set of drawings and castings for this locomotive, and very many of them were built from it. But none of them were as good as this one, and there were a couple of reasons for it. One was when Harry built this engine, this whole tender cradle is separate from the main frame, and there's a good bit of flexibility in this joint. When Lester des designed his version of it, he carried the main frames right through to the back end so that there was not this flexibility. Now, when this engine goes over a, a rough track, it sort of bends in the middle, which makes it a very flexible engine, and all the weight stays right on the driving wheels. The other designs of locomotives, when they go over a sag in the track, they stay straight, and the weight is concentrated on the ends of them, and they're not quite as much of a locomotive as this. And the firebox was reduced a little bit, and the tank shortened about an inch. This now is 52 years old. Uh, I was very fortunate to get it from one of Harry's grandsons and did a fairly extensive rebuild on it. And now it's, it's a it's another one of the old timers that can go out and really perform. This little locomotive is named Jiminy Cricket, who was a very popular character in one of Walt Disney's films at the time that this was finished, about 1940. This is the first three and a half inch gauge locomotive out of the Puritan Locomotive Works, and my first locomotive. I started building it when I was about 14 and finished it so that it would run when I was about 17. We picked the uh, Pennsylvania A5 switcher 
for the, for the youngster to start because it would be about as simple a locomotive as, as you could come up with that would still be a viable performer on the track. And this has been true. Uh, this locomotive has been run for many, many miles when I was younger, and uh, it still gets taken out for some exercise every once in a while. And as far as people thinking that switching locomotives are very slow things, this locomotive holds the speed record for around the 620-foot track at Danvers. Uh, the, this was first run uh, in 1939 with, a, with just the bare essentials, and then it was a year or so, uh, making the domes and the headlight and the cab. And this is the third tender. The locomotive has worn out two tenders, and this is the third one. And I think this one will last a long time. This was one of the early engines with the spring-driven spring lubricator. This gives an infinitely variable uh, pumping rate of the lubricator. It also has a two-cylinder axle pump. And this is the first engine in this size that had the water control on a, on a valve on the suction side of the pump. This enables the locomotive to only pump that amount of water which is required by the boiler and not a, a, a tremendous excess of water to go through the pump and back into the tender. This made the engine run more smoothly and more economically than ever would have a marvelous superheater or an arch or any of the rest of it. When this, when we were running this, or when I was running this on Welch anthracite coal, the method of firing was to fill the firebox just as full of coal as it would go, and then out onto the track and run until the, the fire burnt down. And this was about <clears throat> two miles, about two and a half miles on one firing. I, I learned a lot of different trades building a locomotive, uh, how to lay things out. I made the patterns for the driving wheels and the, for the cylinders, and the patterns for the do domes. Uh, designed the, uh, the, the front end throttle in this one. This does not have a, a standard throttle of that era, but has a, a very simple front end throttle in that the throttle rod goes the whole way right through the boiler and the valve itself is way up here in the front instead of in the dome or back at the back head like some of them were at the time. Throughout Carl Purinton's time as secretary of the BLS for over 30 years, the hobby grew by leaps and bounds. Hobby magazines appeared on the scene as a vital source of information, including plans for specific projects and schedules of upcoming live steam events. As interest grew in the western states, Mr. Harry L. Dixon volunteered to be secretary of the Pacific region. As the Brotherhood itself progressed, live steam clubs began popping up all over the country. Adrian Bisey, one of the founders of the Pennsylvania Live Steamers, talks about the origins of the first clubs in the United States. In any consideration of the history of uh, live steam clubs in the United States, one of the most interesting observations is to consider, well now, who, who built the first? Well, as far as clubs are concerned, uh, we're proud of the fact that in the East, uh, we are rightfully considered the first because we were organized in 1941 and we've been in continual existence with the track. And our uh, prerogative as far as track planning is concerned, always build the railroad on the ground, which was not followed out uh, by many of the clubs. Now there are many clubs, uh, particularly here in the East and elsewhere, and, but there aren't so very many, uh, that were built uh, let us say in the uh, 1940s, early 1950s. But there's one club that's even older than ours, and that's the Golden Gate Club, 
on the uh, Pacific coast of San Francisco. Now, they're actually older in point of uh, uh, the time of organization. Now, they go back to 1936 when uh, they organized from uh, what they called the uh, Live Steam Kill Guild, and uh, they met in Dick Shattuck's house in uh, Berkeley. And the unusual feature of that was their layout was his layout, half-inch scale live steam in his basement. Now, uh, so they actually antedate us by about uh, 10 years. So I'd say that the, the two oldest clubs in the country, in the point of uh, continuous existence, are Golden Gate on the Pacific Coast and this club here. Uh, the Pennsylvania Live Steamers. In 1950, after 14 years of meeting at Vic Shattuck's house, the Golden Gate Live Steamers acquired land in Redwood Regional Park in Oakland, California. 900 feet of two and a half, three and a half, and four and three quarter inch gauge track was laid at this time. Later, a ground level track was added in the early 1960s. In 1974, the club moved to Tilden Park on the outskirts of Berkeley, high on a mountain overlooking San Francisco Bay. Pennsylvania Live Steamer's first track was located in Paoli, Pennsylvania and ran through an orchard owned by PLS member Ken Souser. The track consisted of 665 feet of ground level loop with 50 foot radius curves for two and a half, three and a half, and four and three quarter inch gauge engines. The club's first run on the Paoli track was made in July 1947. In 1972, the club moved to its present location in Rons, Pennsylvania, where there is currently 5,000 feet of ground level track for two and a half, three and a half, four and three quarter, and seven and one quarter inch gauges. The track features an outstanding 48 foot stainless steel cantilever bridge. As regional clubs were formed throughout America, the Brotherhood of Live Steamers continued as a connecting force, adding memberships to its registry. In 1971, the Brotherhood extended its scope to Canada with the addition of Jack Kerr as secretary for the Canadian region. Soon after, other secretaries were added, 
in Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. The name of the organization was officially changed to the International Brotherhood of Live Steamers in 1977. Today, there are a total of nine secretaries serving the IBLS with the same original purpose as when it was founded, helping lone hands make connections with one another, just as Carl Purinton did in 1932. We asked Carl why he volunteered for the job in the first place. Well, somebody had to do it. I, it was an interesting suggestion. You didn't know any better. You didn't know how much work you were getting into. Well, I was. <laughs> it, those days, it wasn't much work. It was a pleasure because you got letters in from people like Ed Berg and, and Walter Bush, for instance, and a whole lot of people that later on turned out to be intimate friends. And I, I could have gone, driven across the country, and I probably could have run into a live steamer every day on a trip through the list that I had built up over the years. And that's what Harry Dixon did on the Pacific Coast. He took over that end of it. But today, with the magazines and all the different clubs, there's no longer any need of that. The damage has already been done. <laughs> when you love something as much as live steamers love this hobby, you want to pass it on. To see others enjoy what has given you joy. To see what you love continue to thrive. One of the ways a hobby is passed on is within families, from generation to generation, such as in the case of the Purinton family. Shown here are four generations of Purinton. Carl, Charlie, Charlie's son, Cap, and Cap's son, Zach, on Charlie's home track in Byfield, Massachusetts. Live steam has become a family tradition for the Purintons, cherished by one and all. The Brotherhood of Live Steamers is also a family, another way in which the hobby is being carried into the future. On behalf of live steamers everywhere, New Life Productions would like to give a special thanks to Carl Purinton for getting the ball rolling in the first place. Yes, somebody had to do it, and we're glad you did. <laughs>